Welcome to the State of the Ravens Address. I'm your host, Coach Evans, and the State of the Ravens is good. Today, you're going to get a synopsis of where the Ravens are since their loss to the Titans in the playoffs up until today. Coming off a 14-2 regular season, losing tennis in the playoffs, the Ravens fans were scratching their head, wondering what went wrong and who was to blame. Some people blame Lamar. I personally didn't. Some people blame the defense, partially because of trying to tackle Derrick Henry. Henry. Some blame the coaches. Uh, you know, players play, coaches coach. Players are on the field. Uh, personally, I blame the drops. Drop here, drop there. Touchdown here, tip ball here. I personally blame the drops. We Ravens fans had to sit and watch the rest of the playoffs, knowing the only team left that were just as good as us were the Chiefs and the 49ers. The Chiefs who we lost to, 49ers who we beat. Now let's enter the offseason. Chuck Clark was signed to a three-year extension, and I can't say enough about the job Chuck Clark did once he got the green dot on his uh, helmet. He came in and took over for Peanut, who I think just couldn't handle the responsibility of being the organizer and going to make plays and, you know, playing his style. So when Chuck Clark, when Peanut got hurt, I think, and then Chuck Clark got the green dot. I don't know if Peanut got hurt or not, but Chuck Clark got the green dot. His organization skills, his, his ability to put people where they needed to be, to communicate to everybody, to get the defense lined up and get the right plays in, helped our defense tremendously. Tremendously. So to award him with a three-year deal seems fitting to me because he, he earned it this year with putting our defense in a position to make plays, to be communicative, to be uh, not the greatest defense, but be a good enough defense to win games. Next, Tony Jefferson was released. Uh, a lot of people blame uh, TJ for part of the problems that were uh, with our defense early in the game. Um, I can think of one play in particular versus the Browns on Chubb's 88-yard run. If I'm not mistaken, TJ and Peanut were two of the guys that were not necessarily in the gaps they were supposed to be in. Definitely Peanut, possibly TJ. I, I don't really recall 100%. But a lot of people blame Tony Jefferson on the the problems we had in the back end initially. Um, then we got hurt. You know, coincidentally, the defense started to play better. So it didn't bode well for his chances to stand with the Ravens. Then, Yonder retired, which was a big question mark, especially headed toward the giraffe. Yonder retired. He said he knew that this was his last year. There was a speculation, especially after the playoff game, when he stayed on the field and with, with all his family taking pictures and just running around and, you know, doing that sentimental thing. So we kind of knew that was going to happen. We just needed the word to come out so we can kind of see where to go in the draft. But uh, short, shortly after the season, Yonder did a, his retirement press conference, and he did not look like Yonder. So even if he wanted to come back, that would be a massive weight gain that he would have to, to put back on. But he looks good. He looks good. I wish I could drop the way he dropped. Um, next, Judon got tagged. So Judon's um, franchise tag for right around $16 million, which he has not signed a tender yet. Um, but to me, I don't think we could have let him hit the free agent market like we let Smith hit the free agent market. Um, Smith went out and got his money, and I think he pretty much earned it. I think he had a double-digit sacks for the Packers, but we just couldn't let this guy go and then come back with um, Bowser, Ferguson, uh, McPhee. We just we had to have somebody else on that line to to um, get after the QB. Basically, get after the QB. But he still hasn't signed a tender. That's why we still have rumors out there about maybe trading him for or, or pick, trading him and then picking up Clowney. But Judon was tagged for 16 mil, and if he stays, that's what it's going to cost us this year. But even if, even if he does stay, I think his production is going to go way up based off some other additions I'm going to talk about here shortly. He released James Hurst. And I'm sure Joe Nubo was, was excited when this happened. Joe Nubo calls him Jane Worst. But um, every time I think about James, uh, James Hurst, I, I take myself back to San Antonio when we lost to the Chargers in the playoffs and how 
when Hurst was playing left guard, I want to say Melvin Ingram basically had his way with Hurst. I know Ingram is a, a premier pass rusher. He's primarily an edge guy that they bumped inside because of the mismatch. But man, 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 man. At least hold him or something. Touch him, kick him, scratch him, do something. Did you at least pinch? Never mind. Now we can go there. We're going to keep it clean. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up, speaking of Hurst, we traded Hayden Hurst to Atlanta for a fourth round pick and a, um, so we traded Hayden Hurst and a fourth round pick for a second and a fifth in the 2020 draft. Now, with Hayden Hurst, I think it's a good trade for Hayden because he was stuck behind Mark Andrews, who was our best receiver, then Nick Boyer, who was our best blocker. So Hurst was basically between, like if it was a running play, you're probably going to go Andrews Boyer or Boyer. If it's a passing play, you're probably going to go your three receivers and Andrews. And, you know, when we went three tight ends, he got in and he did his thing. When he had the opportunities, he did his thing. He caught a nice little crossing route and turned it into a touchdown versus somebody, and, and he still got wheels. But I think this trade for him is going to be better because he's an older guy, so he really can't just sit there and wait, wait, wait. He needs to, you know, maximize his production before he hits 28, 29, 30. I think he's already 26 or 27. Somewhere up in there. But um, I appreciate what Hurst did while he was here. I think the trades are going to work out for him better than us because, no, I'm going to take that back. The trades are going to work out definitely good in his favor. It'll probably be good for us too because I think we turned those picks into some some good players. But he just needed the opportunity to get on the field. And um, got Julio there. So Julio's going to demand the coverage. Hurst can, can eat up underneath stuff all day long. So, I look for a big year at, uh, out of Hurst in, in and out. Um, next, we picked up Calais Campbell. Jacksonville had a fire sale, a yard sale, a garage sale, whichever one it was. And we swooped in and picked up Calais Campbell for a fifth round pick. Gave up a fifth round pick for probably one of the premier dual defensive linemen. And when I say dual defensive linemen, meaning he can stuff the run and rush the passer. Now, he's not going to blow past people and, like, speed rush. All his rush is going to be power, power, power. And then once he, you know, gets you in the mode of power, he's going to hit you with some more power. So that's where his rushes are coming from. It's, it's not going to be finesse. It's going to be I'm stronger, I'm bigger, I'm tougher than you. At probably about 6'8", 3-something, uh, Calais Campbell is a mountain of a man. So uh, to pick him up, which is – it's going to help Judon, it's going to help Ferguson, it's going to help Bowser, it's going to help McPhee, it's going to help Wolf, it's going to help whoever else is playing D-line. It's going to help Brandon Williams, it's, it's going to help all those guys because he's going to command the attention. And then your other guys, got you get your one-on-one -on -one blocks, you got to win. You get your one-on-one -on -one blocks, you have to win. All right, next. Uh, we traded Chris Worm Wormley to the Steelers. Uh, this one kind of went on the radar, and I really didn't even know about it until I was doing a live, and we were talking about Wormley. And someone in the chat box said, Wormley's gone. So Wormley's at the Steelers um, for a fifth-round pick in the 2020 draft, uh, which the draft had just passed. Wormley was a good rotational guy. Never really did anything to stand out. He just did his job. So it wasn't. I don't think it's too much of a, a loss there, but especially with what we picked up. Uh, next. Resigned Justin Ellis and Jahar Ward. Uh, Jahar Ward was part of that trio that came in, I don't want to say mid-season, but right in that tweener early to mid-season when we picked up uh, Fort, Bynes, and Ward. And they came in and basically put some glue to the defense. Those were three guys that were chilling at the crib, watching games just like you and I. Maybe working out a little bit more than us, but chilling. Uh, EDC got, you know, after those two games versus um, the Chiefs and the way we got gashed versus the Browns, EDC went to work. Found three guys that were um, serviceable guys and turned them into staples in our defense um, this past year. And those three pickups were huge, huge, huge because Jahar Ward made some, play some timely plays, Ford made some timely plays, Vines made some timely plays. If you don't remember, I think it was Bynes 
when we had to combine practices with the Eagles, that Lamar was just totally freaking at, at practice. So um, I don't know if that's how, how he kind of stayed on the radar or what, but Lamar was freaking at, at the, the joint at practice. The, yeah, the joint, the, yeah, the joint at practice. Um, after that, they uh, let Jimmy test the free agent market. And he came on back home. Jimmy Smith was re-signed. One year deal. I think maybe six mil, maybe six, seven mil. I don't know the exact number, somewhere up in that range. But Jimmy comes back. Tavon's comes back. Uh, Marlon is Marlon. Um, Peters is Peters. You still got your rookie, uh, Iman Marshall, that you know didn't get a chance to play a lot last year. Who that cornerback from? Man, that cornerback room is. Loaded, especially if Tavon comes back like he was. Uh, and I don't know if he still is, but at the time he was the highest paid slot corner. We signed him to a nice deal to be the highest paid slot corner in the league. And I don't know if that's still true, but that's the type of talent Tavon is. Um, Jimmy is going to be that veteran presence, that that third corner that, like when they when pink teams go three, four wide, we can stick Jimmy outside, maybe put Marlon in the slot on somebody. Then you're looking at Marlon and Tavon in the slot. And gives you a lot of versatility. Gives you a lot of versatility. Even sticking back there at safety sometimes. See him and Earl back there at safety sometimes. That's Jimmy's gonna give you a lot of versatility. And I like that signing. And that signing is not it didn't get a lot of fanfare, but it's gonna be big in the season, guaranteed. Watch. Jimmy Jimmy being on the field is gonna be big during the season. And yeah, he may give up something. And don't complain when when he does. Jimmy's a little older. Like, <laughs> for some reason, if Jimmy get matched up on Tyreek, and man, don't look to win that one. <laughs> but still, he'll, be, he'll, he'll make plays down the stretch that'll put us in position to win games, and if not win some games for us. He's one of those crafty veterans that has been a Raven for a long time. He's one of the few guys that's still around for the championship team. I think him and the punter are maybe the only two guys left from the championship roster. All right, after that, we re-signed Chris Moore, special team guy who's going to have to fight, fight, fight for a position on the 53. Tell you, Chris Moore is in for the battle of his career to stay on this roster. He'll have to do more than just special teams this year, I think, to, to keep a spot. I really do. I really do. But the competition brings out the best in most people, and hopefully that'll be that for him. Um, as far as Anthony Levine, tough. Uh, Earl Thomas is back there. Chuck Clark's trying to play the, the hybrid role. Um, can Levine beat be Clark out? Uh, I don't think so, because Clark does so much mentally. Clark does so much mentally that it's going to be tough for Levine to come in and, and get a lot of PT. Unless something happens, you know, somebody gets hurt. But it's going to be tough, tough, tough. So, Levine, you know, Levine's definitely probably going to be a special team. But um, re-signing him just, just adds depth to that secondary. Uh, after that, Derek Wolf, which was an interesting signing. I didn't know much about Derek Wolf. When I went back and watched his tape and the stuff he did in Denver, his camaraderie with Vaughn Miller I don't want to say he made Von Miller, but he made Von Miller a bunch of plays, which in turn probably made Von Miller a bunch of money. His his, his pick and roll game with Von Miller was damn near Stockton and Malonis. And if you don't know who John Stockton and Carl Malone is, you know, go back to some of those those um, old NBA tapes when if it wasn't for Michael Jordan and the Bulls, Stockton and Malone probably would have two or three championships. Their pick and roll game was nasty, precise, Pick and pop. Oh, this football. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, back to Wolf. Wolf would um, he take two defenders and, and take the shoulder of the other one, and Von Miller would loop off of it and come scot free. Or Von would kind of stack behind him, and, and and Wolf would take off and just take the shoulder of the tackle, and Von would just take one step and dip right back inside of him. So not saying Wolf created Von Miller, but Wolf definitely made Von Miller a ton of money with that chemistry. He did a lot of the dirty work which in turn stick him, Blaze Campbell, Judon, and somebody else, maybe McPhee in there. That's a formidable third down front four rush. You can get pressure with those four without having to blitz. Just think about it. Calais Campbell and McPhee or Wolf, 
the two inside guys. Then you got Judon and McPhee or Wolf as the other outside edge guy. That's or Ferguson, or you know, if he bring something other than bull rush, that's formidable. You don't have to blitz to get pressure with those four. And then you can drop seven. You can drop seven. Which what what most of these the best teams, when I say the best teams, the really good teams have four guys that can get pressure, and the other guys playing coverage. Other guys playing coverage. All right. Then came the draft. Now we're at the draft. Uh well, I was on a huge stream. I was on a stream with uh Vach Lombardi for Day one, we did a Raven stream with uh, some Ravens YouTubers on day two. And I'm really just gonna go through these picks real quick and kind of tell you where we at. First round pick, Patrick Queen, uh, LSU. He was my number two uh, linebacker from my, my top nine at nine. If it wasn't for Isaiah Simmons, and Isaiah Simmons probably shouldn't have been in there because he's uh, edge, linebacker, DB, safety, water boy, bus driver, assistant coach. Um, and daycare owner. That, uh, that's what Isaiah Simmons is. He's all that at one time. <laughs> but so just take Isaiah Simmons out. That means Patrick Queen's my number one linebacker. And a Queen was behind Devin White last year. I think his name is Devin White. Plays, uh, got drafted last year. Former running back. Devin White was a running back too in high school. So LSU has transferred two running backs to linebackers and they've become first round picks. Good job of, of uh, developing kids at, at LSU. Uh, he's a speed guy, sideline to sideline, uh, good in coverage, uh, brings the the wood okay, brings the wood okay, and um, for the most part, when his fundamentals of tackling gets down, he's going to be a good tackler. The thing about it, tackling is you have to do it in game because you're not allowed to really practice it much on the high school, college, or NFL level. So your, your real practice tackling comes from in-game tackling. Um, and so if you haven't I also did a video on Queen so check that out I'll put the link in the what are the white eye buttons on beside me right now um, second round pick at pick number 55 we picked J.K. Dobbs which was a head scratcher for me I was like what are we doing why are we picking a running back we don't need no running back we good at running back I was like what are we doing I was upset to say the least I was upset to say the least. Then we got rid of pick 60. But let's talk about Dobbins for a second. Dobbins was my second running back in my top nine at nine. He was, he, uh, Swift was number one, Dobbins was number two. So the first two picks, before I go into Dobbins a little bit, we got basically my number one linebacker and then my number two running back. So even though I was complaining, we got two good picks based off my evaluation of key. We had two good picks in two rounds. So I was complaining, but we still got good value at those picks. Now, think about Dobbins. And I did a video on Dobbins, too. Uh, that's going to be linked one side of my head, one of the ways. Um, 2,000 yards rushing. 2,000 yards rushing at Ohio State. Uh, they ran a lot of zone read type stuff, so he'll be familiar with that. He can catch the ball at the backfield okay. If I had to rank pass catchers out of the backfield running back wise, I would go uh, Clyde Edwards Elair, uh, Swift, and then Dobbins. But overall, I think Dobbins was the number two running back in this draft, and we got him. Um, potential star in the making. <laughs> Just think, and as upset as I was when we picked him, the more I thought about it, potential star in the making. Especially growing with Lamar. Growing with Lamar. Uh, maybe not this year. Maybe not this year. But next year, I think he's going to contribute this year. But next year going forward, when he probably is going to be the man, if, you know, if he has a good rookie year, because this may be Mark's last year in Baltimore. And then think about that game again, back to the Titans game. Mark was hurt, and we really didn't run the ball with Gus or Justice. I don't know if they didn't trust him or the Titans defense was that good up front, but we didn't. When Mark went out, run game was out for the most part. Then you add in those drops and get off the soapbox. Stay where you get. All right, next one. Justin Matabuke. Uh, Texas A&M pick number 71. Uh, the one of his former teammates is on the team, Mac, by Dylan Mac, Dylan Mac, however you say it. And th looking at Matabuke, I was like, man, eh, yeah, he's all right. I mean, we get some D-line there, but we just picked up Campbell. Kind of what are we doing? Again, did tape on Matabuke. Thank you. 
Um, Adidas Tate versus LSU. He was double teamed versus um, Cushionberry, which was who I wanted to draft, and Lewis a lot, a ton that game. But when he got solo blocks, he was winning. He won his solo blocks for the most part in that game. And if I'm not mistaken, he may have been single blocked maybe eight or nine times in the whole game, and he probably won six or seven of those reps. And I and I think two were against whoever their left tackle was. One or two was against Cushionberry, and then the other three-ish or whatever the number is was against Lewis. But other than that, he was double teamed by Cushionberry and Lewis, or Cushionberry and whoever their left tackle is. But when he got solo blocks, single blocks, he won. So that kind of made me understand why we we drafted him at the bouquet. He he's definitely, I can say definitely. I think he'll make the team before Mac actually makes it. All right, moving on. Uh. Third round pick, pick number 92, Devin DuVernay. Uh, DuVernay is a, a stocky rece slot receiver, played inside and outside of Texas. Uh, ran a 4-3. He uh, ran a 4-3 on over at the combine at his pro day, but he ran a 4-3. And uh, had a ton of catches, very minimal dropping. Now, with that being said, a lot of DuVernay catches are, are bubble screens, tunnel screens, and quick hitting reps, which... In his defense, he's not the coach. He's not calling the play. So that's why I think his catch, his catch percentage or his drop percentage is so low. His drop percentage is so low. And which is good because we need people to not drop the ball, referencing what I said earlier, why I thought we lost the game, the playoff game. Um, but, you know, Duvernay, speed guy. And he, you know, if you go back and watch his highlights, he got passes down the field. So don't make, don't, don't make, don't get it twisted thinking. He's all short routes that I just, I just, a ton of his routes are, are there. And it's been confirmed by multiple people that watched that video that they were at Texas games and it was almost predictable what routes were going to be ran by DuVernay and the Texas offense. So they just ran them over and over. So it's not necessarily his fault, it, but you know, he a player, he got to play. The coaches call the plays. Like I said, players play, coaches coach. Uh, but I, I like him for the potential screen game that we have that we didn't have last year. The, uh, RPO type stuff where he can get inside of guys and we can fake the run and whatnot and hit him on quick, quick run. Now, what I will say about Duvernay is he is no block, no rock, stamped. That little muscle hamster would get in there and get after it. He would get in there and get after it. Linebacker says that he don't really care. He'll get in there and block his butt off when he have to. Moving on to the next pick, which is I think was one of the most crucial picks in the draft. And how he lasted this long, I do not know. Malik Harrison, pick number 98, uh, linebacker from Ohio State. Now, we got my technically number one linebacker. And Malik was technically my number four linebacker in that top 99. So we got my number one linebacker, my number four linebacker, my number two um, running back. So let me see if I can call off the linebackers I had uh, in front of him. So I had um, Queen... I was really high on Troy Dye, Murray, and then Harrison. And keep in mind, we're throwing Isaiah Simmons out of there. All right. Harrison is the – that's that. That's that's it. Move on to the next pick. That's, that's what Harrison brings. He brings you that. And he's very athletic, more, even more athletic than I thought. Because if you watch my video, link, uh, you'll see that I didn't think he was extremely athletic. But after watching more and more when I watched Chase Young, when I watched the Cooter, I was still able to see Malik Harrison way more athletic than I thought. So um, we got a good steal there, good deal there. Next one is Tyree Phillips. Uh, he's going to bring us depth in the O-line. Could possibly slide in and battle for some rotational play at guard. I don't think he's going to see the field much, but he definitely could get in there if somebody went down and, and get in that rotation on battle um, and battle powers and, and – and other guys for, you know, some PT. Um, who else? What's next? Pick, fourth round pick, we picked Ben Bredesen, interior old lineman. Um, same thing him with, with Tyree. Hope get in there and battle with powers, and, and if somebody goes down to potentially be in that that rotation. But, and we'll talk about why I think, I'm saying them getting in the rotation, not playing. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, next, Roger Washington, which was interesting. Roger Washington was a head scratcher for me initially until I watched tape. Um, 
let me give you a little story a little bit. Jordan Brooks was in my top nine at nine. And I think he was number eight or nine. I had Jordan Brooks ranked like, I think Logan Wilson missed, would have been my 10th linebacker if I would have did 10. But Jordan Brooks was like number nine or number eight, something like that. He was drafted a pick before Patrick Queen, the first round. I don't think he's as good as any of those top five guys I put out there. But the reason why he was able to be free and run around and make plays, because he is fast, is the guy we picked, Roger Washington. Roger Washington played um, four tech, played four I, played five when they were, when they was like pass rush situation. No, not pass rush, when they needed like edge support. And when they went to their speed rush stuff, he played nose. So when he was at nose, he freed up Jordan Brooks to do all kind of blitzes because he was commanding double teams, commanding double teams, play with good effort. The only negative I saw in his game, I didn't watch a ton of games. I only watched the one game. I think it was versus Oklahoma. The only negative I had in that video was his arm actions not being violent enough. His his rips, his overs, his 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 uh, extensions. I didn't think a lot of his arm and arm actions were violent enough, but that can be helped with reps and coaching. Reps, coaching, and, and obviously weightlifting is going to go help with that. Not saying he weak, don't put words in my mouth, but that's going to be helped with reps um, and technique. Because you can't just, you can do something violently, but if the technique ain't right, it ain't, ain't going to work. If I can violently slap my hand down, but if I don't hit the defender in the right spot, it's all not going to go anywhere. It's going to be like a, and then we just going to have two bones hit each other, maybe one of my break or something, but it ain't going to stop or but you win the rep. All right. Next, I have James Prochet. James Prochet, another sure-handed guy from SMU. He was picked number 201 in round six. Um, about Prochet. Prochet had a low, low, low drop rate also. But, as I should say, were more downfield and not in that same area that, that Duvernay. But if you look at Prochet's highlights and some of the video I put out there on Prochet, please. His catches were down the field. His, his, he, he, to be that small, he won a lot of jump balls too. <laughs> he won a lot of jump balls. He ran some good routes, um, especially his post curl. His post curl is, is pretty nasty, and that's on that video too. Um, but his 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 low pass, his low drop rate, his balls are down the field. His attempts, his catches, his his targets are down the field. They're not necessarily right around the line of scrimmage. So uh, he's gonna be, I think, battling Willie for that slot, that slot position, and not in the, but not in the screen game necessarily. And my my biggest negative for Proche is those small choppy steps that he can't run away from people, but those small choppy steps will help him in traffic. So it's a it's a gift and a curse for him with with his his stride length. They'll help him, you know, keep his feet to the ground and quickly, boom boom, you know, hit, hit somebody with some wiggle. But then once he get out of something, I don't think he's just going to outrun NFL DB. But if we just move the chains, that's what we need. Because we're, we're a chain moving play. We're a chain moving team. Chain moving team. Our big plays come when you forget to contain them all. That's when our big plays come. So we're a chain moving team. And I think Proche is going to help with that. And last pick, seven round, Geno Stone. Geno Stone, safety from Iowa. Um, He's gonna be in a tough battle, man. I already talked about the safety room. So you add him in there, then you're gonna add a UDFA I'm about to talk about in a second. And it's gonna be tough, tough, tough for Stone to make. Tough, tough, tough. Um, but let's talk about those UDFAs. We got cornerback Jeff Heckman from the Red uh, Redlands, probably not gonna make it. Uh Bronson Richstein from Kennesaw, which I love. I did the um the reaction video, my first reaction video to, to Rick Steiner, that links there. Um love Rick Steiner. Hope he makes the team as a fullback. Um, Michael, what's it? How you say it? Dude. Michael D from Georgetown. I don't think he's gonna make it. Sean Pollard from Clemson. It's gonna. It's tough because we got two centers. We got Sean Pollard from Clemson and Christian, the Tristan Castillo Colon from Missouri. And uh, our O line. It's gonna be tough. It's gonna be tough. <laughs> it's gonna be tough for either one of those guys to to get in that room. I can see practice squad for one of them. And I think that that one that's gonna make that practice squad is uh, Tristan Castillo Colon. I think I said that right. Uh, next, Chauncey Rivers from Mississippi State. He has a chance to make it. We didn't. 
We didn't draft edge guys. We didn't draft edge guys. But we signed somebody a little bit later that's going to make it tough on Chauncey to make it. I, I hope Chauncey makes it, at least for the practice squad, because Chauncey was a four or five star talent in high school uh, with the East, East Mississippi. Did good there. Did good at Mississippi State. So if Chauncey can channel the, the, that fire, that flame that made him that good prospect in high school, he has a good chance of, at minimum, making the practice squad. Next. Um, Khalil Dorsey, Q, uh, not QB, cornerback. Cornerback's nah, tough. Practice squad, maybe. Um, Jalen Moore, receiver. Look at his highlights. Didn't see. He, he went to a small school. He didn't jump out to me, so it's gonna be tough on him. Uh, Josh Nurse, who's interesting. Josh Nurse is a cornerback, and I know I just mentioned how our cornerback room is tough and, and it's gonna be it, it's, it's loaded already. But Nurse has something that a lot of quarterbacks don't. He, he hadn't been playing corner long, and he's 6'3". He's 6'3". I think this may – he may have switched to DB his sophomore, junior year at Utah, and he's 6'3". That link will give him opportunities to, you know, for people to, to be patient with. Off that, that length alone will give – he'll have opportunities for coaches and organizations to be patient with him simply because he's 6'3", and you don't get a lot of 6'3 corners. They're going to try to develop him, which I see him definitely making the practice squad to to be a, a stash guy, a stash guy. Um, next on that list, Nigel Warrior, who is the other safety I, I was going to talk about from Tennessee. And he didn't get drafted, but I, I think Warrior's better than Stone. I really do. I think Nigel Warrior's better than Stone. Um, after that, we have... Uh, Marcus Willoughby, I don't know much about Marcus, I'm just going on, nothing negative, nothing positive. Tight end Eli Wolf from Georgia. Uh, we did draft a tight end. We do have three on roster. Wolf has a chance. Wolf is going to be in a fight with, um, I forget the third tight end is on the roster, and also Breland. Breland from Oregon. Those two are going to battle it out, in my opinion, for that third tight end spot. And I, I give the early edge, in my opinion, to Breland right now. Even though Wolf plays some good ball at George, the early age for me goes to Breland. Um, next UDFA is um, Breland, which just talked about. Edge guy, John Docker from James Madison University. Couldn't find any film on him, but I will give you a place to find some film on him. Uh, Vosh Lombard did a, a, a video about the other edge guy at JMU. And so you can kind of catch glimpses of Docker on that video. So I'll link that to uh, one of these dots, whichever side it's on. But uh, I think Docker was five and the other guy was seven or vice versa. But if you watch that video, you'll get glimpses of Docker and see that he's pretty darn fast coming off that edge. Pretty darn fast. I can just say speed, 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 and most speed. <laughs> um, next we have Christian Welch, linebacker. Tough. We drafted two. Uh, got two other guys there. I don't really know how many linebackers we keep interior guys, but it's going to be tough on them. Uh, and we picked up an old lineman Deshaun Dixon, and um, practice squad at best, I think, for Dixon, too. I think Dixon played at San Diego State, maybe. I, I watched video on him. I just don't remember much about him. So with that being said, I don't practice squad at most. And that's the most of the UDFAs. I'm sure there's more out there, but those are the guys that I know, like, have signed and whatnot. And the draft. And so we move on to, after the draft, we signed DJ Fluker, which he finally came in, signed his paperwork and whatnot. So to me, with that being said, our O-line, starting O-line, if we had to start today, in my opinion, you'd have Stanley, Bozeman, Skura or Macari, Fluker, Zeus. That's pretty good. <laughs> That's pretty good to run the ball. People, Seattle people, you know, complain about Fluker with penalties. They don't care about that. That that will penalties happen, and somebody gotta gotta have the most. Somebody gotta have the least. It's it's just the nature of sports. Somebody gotta have the most three pointers. Somebody gotta have the least amount of three pointers. Somebody gotta have the most touchdowns. Somebody gotta have the most interceptions. It happens. It happens. It happens. But they'll be cleaned up because O linemen in Baltimore love it. Because he's going to run, 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 run. And just look at Yonder's comments when he talked about retiring. Or after he retired. He said this was the most fun he had had in so long because he ran the ball so much. 
offensive linemen love to run block. They pass block because they have to, but they love to run block, and Fluka's going to enjoy it here in Baltimore. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I heard he, he took, he passed on some deals to come to Baltimore, if I'm not mistaken. Correct me if I'm wrong in the uh, comment section. Uh, then we re-signed Pernell McPhee. That's just the signing I thought hurt Chauncey Griffith's chance of making the, the 53. Re-signing Pernell McPhee. So you bring back that veteran that can play inside and out uh, alongside of Wolf, alongside of Campbell, alongside of Judon, alongside of Bowser, uh, alongside of Ferguson if he gets something other than Bull Rush. Then we, we good, we good. We, that's why I said at, at the beginning of this video, the state of the Ravens is good. It's good. Now, I want to say great, but it ain't great because we didn't win Super Bowl. But looking forward to this season, I'm excited. I'm excited. All right, which brings us to today. We don't know where the OTA is going to start, when training camp is going to start, or when the season actually going to start. But I do know this. When we get back to on the field, it's Super Bowl a buzz for us because of the team that we that EDC has put together um, this season. That I think that Titans game was a fluke. I think they just caught us. They found maybe a crack in our armor and exploited it. And especially once we got behind. If had we had, I'm gonna go on my soapbox for a minute. Had that ball that Andrews tipped just hit the ground and not been intercepted, I still think we win the game. I still think we win the game. Had that ball just hit the ground and we punted or went down and scored three. Or even a touchdown, I think we win the game. But that ball, that ball Andrews tipped, not hitting the ground, sealed it for us, to me. And I know it was early, but that's my two cents. Um, and so in the next videos coming up, because we're not going to have a lot of news, with the draft gone, the draft was our big news thing coming up. I think it was the most watched draft ever. So I'm going to start trying to break down these position battles. Uh, some will be easier than others. Uh, like quarterbacks and running backs, I may do together because that video may be two minutes long because we know who's in that pecking order. But um, a lot of people have supported. We're on the road to 4,000. We're close to it, probably less than 50 away from 4,000. Um, and some people, you know, I get, still get a message of how can you support. I uh, got PayPal link, uh, Cash App, got Patreon, and got Super Chat whenever we do live. So all you that have done that so far, I appreciate it, especially the Patreon people. We got some exclusive stuff that's going to go to Patreon. And probably some of these position breakdowns are going to go just to Patreon. So if you you know want to subscribe to the Patreon, do so. Um, you don't even miss that You know when it comes out. You don't even miss it. if you if you Because I subscribe to some other people's Patreon, and I don't even miss it when it comes out on the first. I know. But uh, I appreciate the support. And um, if you like what you saw, hit the like button. Uh, if you want to stay up to date on my version of the Ravens content, hit the subscribe and hit the bell notification for when I do put out videos, you'll be some of the first to know and when I do the live videos also. So with that being said, I know this was a lengthy video, but until next time, see you when I see you. Peace. With